question, which you know a little bit more about you. So how would you describe yourself probably in two three sentences if you know, we can go around? Mm -hmm. I work for the education project here with Vasavi and my area of interest are uh, with the children and how they are going to I'm working with mathematical modeling in the department but I'm more interested in pure mathematics and uh, more specifically geometry. Mm -hmm. We are working on the last year. And my area of the first place is the same. And we can just pass to you. I'm sure I was just a little bit working on Parliament. My focus is on the parliamentarians' perspective and their knowledge about science and technology and how they generate the country's SMD. Basically, that way I'm looking at it. And that's why I'm posted there in the basic level of annual week. Same name, Salim Nagtaya. This is the Sushi and now the history of social ecology, private education. I'm Sahana Mukhan. My agent of this is media sociology. But I am falling in love with Aristotle and Plato and it has been very recent since this morning. <laughs> my name is Meera. Um, I am uh, basically, uh, background is in psychology and analytic science and uh, my area of focus, uh, and philosophy of course, and my area of interest is in uh, nature and Indian thought and how Indians perceive, Eastern people perceive nature in terms of philosophy, nature, culture. And I'm also falling in love with uh, philosophy and logic at home. My name is Lata. My uh, area of interest uh, is in teaching practices with a um, uh, zoologist. It's for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in here. I'm also in the taking the Indian Kura project that's here. The social science and anthropology here. And yeah, I am a teacher and a teacher trainer. Basically, working in the area of science education, I think I have more questions than answers. Excuse me, I don't know. Would you like to see? I think I'm not going to hear my mouth. You are comfortable sitting here? Yeah, that's right. Okay, you know my name, my name is Sangeeta and I have some background in biology, my graduation is in philosophy. Uh, what I'm excited all about is why our mind thinks in certain ways and why we are the way we are. Uh, of course, I mean, I can be very general fashion, but uh, I need to do a little bit of philosophy and also from psychological perspectives on consciousness. Uh, today what I wish to do is, I think, as per the time, I have one and a half hours. But I guess, since we also starting late, at least by 25 minutes, so we can go 25 minutes more, and uh, if you all agree, we can probably, you know, uh, not, not, don't, don't have to stop it, but uh, probably we can be, I mean, unless you have other appointments, uh, so we can, I hope uh, you will be free if it is, we can exceed a little bit. I hope that's okay. Tea break. Tea break. Probably we can have a three and then three and three is the tea. Three is the tea. Uh, well, it's so difficult to start talking about philosophy because it's a huge subject, and also it's not a subject which is completely unknown to us. You know, because the, the, the moment you start thinking, probably philosophical ideas, philosophical concepts come to you this way. It's very natural to be involving, engaging in a philosophical discussion, even if you So what I'll do is, in between, I'll talk about, and I will also involve your participation, because philosophy is not teaching, you know. Philosophy is basically dialogue. Philosophy has started as dialogue in Greece, in the West, and the East, of course. So if one person just talks about philosophy, that becomes a philosophy lecture, but not a philosoph philosophical engagement. 
since we want to look at philosophy as an engagement, as a participatory enterprise, probably we would involve more of interaction than a lecture. Is that okay, Sahana? Yeah. All right. And I would also, in between, like you to read some material, actually, you know, and then discuss. We, of course, won't have time to read a lot, but at least some pieces, and then we'll discuss about it. Uh, since I guess most of you would have at least thought about the word philosophy or the discipline philosophy, you would have some idea about it also. So, how would you define philosophy, Indira? Uh, yeah, actually, I was just thinking on the way to class. I think it's basically answering the why question. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so multi perspectiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, philosophy is like. Uh, some total of human knowledge, a kind of an approach to looking at a, a holistic approach to human knowledge itself. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a holistic approach, perspective mm -hmm. of human knowledge itself. Okay. Rather than dealing with the particulars of it, it mm -hmm. sums up the whole of uh, uh, yeah. the ways of thinking, the ways of knowing. Of human okay. Uh, trained and disciplined way of thinking, way of thinking, way of thinking. Okay. You don't know. That's the most important answer, actually, <laughs> to what is philosophy. That's the most profound answer. Challenging your thoughts to get both uh, good and bad in a philosophy. Okay. Churning for good and bad, right? Churning your thoughts. Yes. To know what's good and bad. Yes, Murugan. Same. Same? Even what's good and bad, right? Okay. But when in you my definition, don't concentrate on good and bad. Uh huh. Churning the thoughts. Okay, that you, you want to stress on churning churning. the process, not the, the process. Yes. Process is the philosophy. Okay. Outcome is again the, uh, the result of philosophy. Okay. That's a different thing. You may get amrita, you may get some poison also. Okay. That's a different thing. That depends on the how you churn and how you okay. on the process. <laughs> but the major thing is on the churning, churning the, the process. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Kishore. An examination as to what the world should be like and what it is. This examination of what the world should it be and what it is and what it should be, right? I think it's a way of finding, explaining uh, certain events and phenomena that happen in daily life. Exploring, you said. Explaining. Explaining, okay. Explaining right. daily phenomena in your life. You want to participate in this, Rajini, or you want to be the silent witnesses? Yeah. Okay. But you are welcome to participate if you have a point. What about you, Arun? Same thing. Same thing, silent witness. Another word that strikes me is truth. I didn't search for the truth. Search for truth. It me like a yeah. Use certain techniques to invoke more alertness. So, if you don't mind, uh, Lena, would you like to say anything upon any one of the particular responses to what philosophy is, which anybody, one of you said, yeah, going not yours, but anyone else? Yeah. Going by what Indira was saying, trying to find out the, the answers for the why, the question why. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, going one step ahead, I also would be why we do it is because we want to. Put things in order, you know, some kind of an ordering mm -hmm. of events or you know relationships mm -hmm. and their outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're constantly asking why it happens. Okay. To find a place of to find the kind of an order right. in terms of interrelationships. Mm -hmm. Kishore, did some something strike with this other six, seven, uh, eight, nine perspectives? Uh, let's say I uh, came this morning, so I'm about to. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. It's it's the jet lag. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Murugan? Trying to find out. Uh, you have to refer exactly. to any any one particular response the rest of the people yeah. made. See, Mira said. Mira said, okay. Quest for truth. Quest for truth, yeah. Yeah, I want to 
Uh -huh. so what I said is no, no, not to you, said. No, we want to hear what you think about what others yeah, said. Her, 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 what she said. Which, she, who? First lady, yeah. Her name is Indira. Mm, sorry. Uh, she said, knowing uh, the why, mm, getting the answer for the why. It's uh, something like a philosophy which is never ending, mm -hmm. but what I feel. Uh, maybe uh, knowing the truth, it may end sometime. Mm -hmm. You can get the truth. Mm -hmm. That depends on how you search for the truth. But knowing why is a never-ending thing. Mm -hmm. Even after getting the truth, again the question is there why. It's a never-ending philosophy. Whatever Ramira said, maybe it may end, I don't say it will definitely end. It, it will end mm -hmm. once you get the truth. Mm -hmm. So then you will not say what is the next truth. Okay. So you will be satisfied. Okay. It also gets redefined, I think, even that truth. Maybe, maybe truth may be redefined. You may be knowing some truth right now. Mm -hmm. You may be the other thing. Redefining is again uh, momentary satisfaction. Once you redefine it, okay, today I am happy. Let us say tomorrow I will redefine it again. If it is really required. But why it will say, if you get one particular uh, reason or something, then again you will say why. I mean, uh, some sort of abstract why Okay, so the, what basically what you are saying is we always want to know why certain things happen in the way it happens, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Today I have most people answer questions here. Um, the question, one question here that you asked. Um, so, what question here? They all seem to be answering, I mean, particular parts of what philosophy is about. I mean, the way the discipline is constructed. Some people ask questions which we can shift to metaphysics or or into ethics. Um, things like they were everything uh, in one of them asked one of one of the more fundamental questions, how the one that you raised at the beginning. Uh, how do we know what we know? Uh, That's more fundamental? I think, think more, I think it's the most fundamental question. Yeah, just one second, for sure. Okay, it's, it's something a, okay. Something that all of us miss. All right. Yes. Uh, this question is so subjective. Um, Which question? Well, what is philosophy? Okay. You know, each philosopher almost tries to answer it on their own. Uh -huh. I know Aristotle, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Levinas all had yes. different answers to yes. what they thought philosophy mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a good point. I, actually, I have something to tell about that, what you said, which, I, which I'll just reserve for a moment. Well, um, searching for the truth uh, could be stepping on a very slippery ground because. Uh, in your attempt to understand philosophy, you are using a very ambiguous term for truth. So I guess I'm just confused about truth and how... What is truth at all, right? But what was your point, Sahana? What did you define I mean, philosophy? It's a trained and disciplined way of thinking. Okay. That itself probably a definition of what is true to not true. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the question... Uh, uh, the, the answer that India gave, uh, why of things, and uh, if I look at it like a comparison between sciences and philosophy, the way we are trained to think in our uh, junior classes, I, I can actually see, when you ask the question how, it gives us science, when you ask the question why, it goes into the realm of philosophy, so mm -hmm. I felt that uh, the person Okay. We felt all these are happening one after the other. All the whatever no, responses said. We begin with why, why are things happening, and then we are churning our thought. Mm. Most of it just happening, and I ask why, how come it is happening like this? Yeah. Then I think, okay, I have reached now. Then in a very disciplined way, mm. methodical way, I why, you know, which people mm -hmm. ask, or which people. Then I, th I feel like, okay, I have reached that. Mm. Then some other perspective comes up. Then I realize it may not be the one which I was. Mm. It changes. So that is philosophy. That realization, as we go on and on, we realize things change. Things changing, or the way in which we look at things are also changing. Changing. Yeah. That is philosophy. Mm -hmm. Any point, Indira, other than yours, struck you? Yeah, I mean the resonance was with truth. I mean, I think that uh, is uh, in a way a search, but not a truth. I mean, when you say truth, it has to be ultimate. Truth. And then you have to know that you've got there. And that's how do you know that you get there? Which brings us back to that question of how do we know what we know at all? And, uh, so if it is truth, then what is truth? And, uh, is there such a thing as ultimate truth? Is it something?
I mean, a relative truth isn't satisfying. It's not satisfying to say it's true for here and now, but but that doesn't sound true like true. Yeah. Okay. What is the ultimate truth? Yeah. Right? Okay. <laughs> if but is some, some is somehow that. truth will give you a little bit satisfaction. Once you get, then you will say after getting the satisfaction, whatever truth I am having may not be. But once you get some truth, you will say, okay, for moment, I am satisfied with the truth. Then you will think the next day. Yeah, I mean, there are like partial, sorry to interrupt, no, no, but no. partial truths like in algebra, yeah, or you're, you're doing a trigonometry, you say, yeah, fine. I mean, right hand side is equal to left hand side, yeah, it's true, it works, I'm satisfied. But that's, Again, that's not different. philosophical for me. Yeah, that's yeah. what, that's what. Philosophical seems yeah. to go deeper into existence, into what is existence, I mean, that too. So. Continuity is a philosophy. Yeah. But truth is not an absolute entity, right? Is it not? You know, there is truth, and I'm going closer to that, and I'm, you know, going farther right. away from it. This, you know, I think the more appropriate term would be consensus. Just take the consensus of the majority of people at that period, finish it off. But under one particular frame of reference, <laughs> truth is an absolute for you. Under one particular frame of reference. Otherwise, uh, you cannot, I mean, uh, you cannot survive at all. In that particular reference, if you take truth for a moment or for that particular reference, if it's the absolute, then you will go to the next stage. And I think that frame of reference would be given by what she said, the training and the discipline. That's why yeah. philosophy is a discipline. It's not yet uh, like, you know, free thinking or it's not journal writing. You can write whatever you want. Once so we say truth is uh, not absolute, we are out of frame of reference. We have to be in frame of reference, then think about the philosophy, then go out of the frame of reference that elaborate the, uh, the domain of philosophy. Uh, the truth for a hungry man is food. Mm -hmm. it's saying like that. That's but, again. But one of the things what I also about truth is uh, how do we know when, when when I say something is true for myself to be satisfied? If I know that is the truth, is that enough? So do I need consensus of another person to tell me that's the same truth? Or is it universal? Is it subjective? And I think those are the kinds of questions philosophy actually tries to answer itself. As we are discussing what is philosophy, we are entering into a philosophical dialogue. Actually, there you are elaborating your reference now. Earlier, you are the reference. <laughs> For your satisfaction, truth is fine. Then you I mean, elaborated your reference, let us check out what is the other people concerned. Okay, I think. Uh, Actually, I could say that the lecture is over and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, this is why I always think philosophy is not a kind of exclusive discipline, you know, which I, you can give a full-fledged lecture. I mean, of course, you can talk about different philosophers, different kinds of philosophies, but probably we, each one of us are born with certain ways of looking at life and the events which we have in our, um, you know, day-to-day -day interactions and so on. So. I don't think it's possible for somebody to have to have a complete absence of a philosophical way of looking at things. But at the same time, uh, philosophy is just not any way of looking also. I mean, as uh, one of you said, there is a disciplined way of looking also. There's a certain, certain style, certain methods, certain techniques, uh, certain goals, certain areas which are considered as part and parcel of philosophy. If you are doing philosophy, you need to engage in discussion in certain uh, areas uh, which would uh, entitle you as a philosopher. Okay? Uh, but uh, before I go into that, let me, listening to all of you, let me just try to reiterate uh, probably or paraphrase what you have said, that how do we define philosophy? Uh, well, if you define philosophy, you have to talk. Of, you have to define reality. So the discussions on uh, philosophy would certainly involve the question of reality: what is real, or what are the different ranges of reality? You know. So what is the? the this is the classic uh, discussion between appearance and reality, and it is not just Eastern, but very much Greek. And also a person like Russell, who has thought about quite a bit into it, which we will come, uh, I hope to come to it soon. Uh, the other idea is truth, which many of you said. I mean, this is, truth is an idea which people can be so passionate in their life, you know. 
So it could be just one truth, one ultimate truth. Uh, it could be also relative truth. So they, we can talk about in a very relative frame, can talk about also in a more absolute or conservative. Again, truth, there are different kinds of truth. You can talk about logical truth. You can talk about probably more metaphysical truth. You know, so maybe again, you can also talk about truth in some sense of a moral truth. But uh, truth is in a technical sense has been used in philosophy more in an area called epistemology. I'm sure some of you would be familiar with this. Everybody is familiar with this term, epistemology? Is anybody not familiar? I'm familiar, but I didn't You don't know. Okay, so only Sahana. Okay. Uh, Sahana epistemology literally would mean a kind of a delving into knowledge, epistemy. Okay. And there are three uh, sub areas in philosophy which are considered very important to do any kind of philosophy, which is uh, metaphysics, uh, ontology, and uh, logic and epistemology. Of course, morality, ethics, is a definitely an important issue. But uh, you have to consider metaphysics, epistemology, uh, logic and epistemology, and ontology. And we will come in a moment what these three things are very soon. Uh, the other idea about uh, when, which we come across when you have to define philosophy, I'm still trying to be on the edge of philosophy, you know, before going into any depths, if at all we think there's a lot of depth which is quite complex, but I'm trying to see in a very general way what, ex what is philosophy. So the third idea I would think is life. I mean philosophy, if philosophy cannot raise fundamental questions about life in general, you know, then we have to see whether it is really philosophy or whether it's something else. Uh, and I mean, uh, question life in the sense, of course there are so many other dif disciplines which look at life from different points of view, right? Biology looks at life from a different standpoint. Sociology looks at it from a different standpoint. Uh, but can we create a world view, which you said, holistic view? Because philosophy, one aim of philosophy is to help and construct a world view. Out of bits and pieces of knowledge of understanding different events, and phenomena, can you construct a world view? Because unless you construct a world view, you cannot build a theory which is satisfying to you. And unless you build a theory which is okay to you, you will not be able to engage into engage in a discussion and interaction. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you have to be sure about what you want to say, and then only you will be able to understand what the other person says, and then only you will be able to know what are the peculiarities of the concepts and ideas you use and what the other person uses. So to have a world view is again one aspect of philosophy. One advantage of philosophy is to have a world view. Uh, the other important issue is values, the discussion of values in philosophy, which is uh, kind of encompassed in the area of ethics. Uh, any philosopher would have his theory of ethics. So what are the different kinds of values? And again, values can be divided into so many different areas, you know, aesthetics, moral, and so on and so forth. A uh, couple of other ideas, I think, which are important in philosophy. I'm, I'm, telling, I'm talking about philosophy in a very general sense, not particularly looking at any geographical, you know, geographically isolated philosophy, for example, only Asian philosophy or Western philosophy, but in any, any philosophical discussions, these ideas would come. Uh, the other idea is the question of self, questioning your identity, you know. For example, Socrates, Socrates inspired all his young students, you know, in his academy and the other schools by this one question, right? Know thyself. So quest questioning your basic identity. So when you question your identity, you would also question the categories, the terms, uh, the structures which you form in your daily life in order to understand something else. So, so when you say that it's a discussion on yourself or your identity, it's not a kind of a solipsistic discussion. We are not talking about something completely personal or private but which allow you to analyze your own structures, your own ways of looking at things, your own, your own ways of responding to things. Because philosophy, after all, is not a dormant, refrigerated discipline, you know. 
It is a discipline much outside because finally philosophy finds its use in helping us to know how we respond to a particular situation, an event or to a person, right? So that's one of the goal of philosophy, how you respond to things. And so that's where the whole idea of self, analysis of the self comes, questioning your identity. So. And probably this is one reason that, again, the discussion on mind and consciousness is very central to philosophy. Though at various times of history, uh, different disciplines have taken it up from philosophy, like other sci sciences, right? Philosophy al always was a large body of knowledge and then it started like, as Patma said, Aristotle and others came and how discipline segregated and whatever you are left with is called as philosophy. <laughs> so that's nice, you know, people take the best things and you have the, uh, you have the remains or, you know, maybe it's the essence, you can say that. Okay, so mind and consciousness is again a very important uh, subject in philosophy, though psychology, brain studies and so many, uh, I mean, today it is a completely different uh, uh, area altogether. Uh, I would also like to mention a couple of Indian ideas, because since we are all Indians and I think culturally and uh, it will be nice to know at least a couple of terms. I know that with this one and a half hours I won't be able to do justice to any particular kind of philosophy, but at least a couple of terms which I want to just mention so that you would have time to look at it later. And this is one is the idea of Atma, Atman. Okay, in various schools of Indian philosophy you would this, you would find this one term, one idea. Uh, and the other is Moksha. Of course the, the, the rough English translation would be liberation and the self, self, right? Individual self or whatever. Uh, we will come into these things later, but I'm just trying to leave these terms, some of these terms. Uh, philosophy, the, you, you would know the origin of this expression, philosophy, right? Philos philosophia, philia and sophia, you would know that. Uh, it is roughly, it can be translated from Greek as love for wisdom or passion for wisdom. It's not, just not love, being passionate about, passionate for this time. It's a bit different between, you know, when you come to passion, you are more excited about it. The other is, can be a little cold also. So it, it can be, you can be passionate about something and then it can make a huge difference. So passion for wisdom. But very interestingly, you know, this popular idea, there's this popular notion that Western philosophy, Greek philosophy and Western or European philosophy in general is more analytic in its style. I'm sure at least some of you would have heard this, right? I mean, it's kind of popular. Uh, Western philosophy, Greek philosophy, European philosophy is more equated with the rational ways, more rational oriented, rationality oriented. And Indian philosophy is more intuitive or mystic, mystic oriented. Well, you know, the, the classic philosophers, at least the European philosophers like Max Muller, or Joyson or many others who are well known have interpreted in such a way, who have popularized such a distinction and later on people like Radhakrishnan, Dasgupta and many others have kind of carried on this popular version of uh, making a distinction between European philosophy as a more reason oriented and Indian philosophy as more mysticism oriented or mind oriented. So we are not more interested in logical processes but we are more interested in mystical ways of thinking things and Europe is more interested in analyzing things, logical way of looking at things. How far is this true is a very serious question and many people are trying to see is this, is this supposition true at all. I was uh, looking at just this definition of philosophy and it struck me, I mean there are so many other arguments to give a different viewpoint altogether, you know, that Indian philosophy of course is also kind of very analysis oriented and in Greek philosophy or in many other Western philosophies you would find a strong place for mysticism and more intuition and more, more meditative approaches to uh, understanding things. But then I was struck with this just this one simple idea of the word philosophy, you know, I mean as I said in Greek, Greek the philosophy, love for wisdom. And anyone of you know what is the popular name for philosophy in India? Yes? Darshana. 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 Have you understood what Darshana means? Darshana literally means... Vision. Seeing. Vision. To see. Vision. Vision. Okay. It can, if we can put it a little more simply, you know, vision can mean 
you know, <laughs> something stupefied or something like that. <laughs> so to put it more down to earth, to see. That's all what means, drish. It comes from the etymology of drish, which means to see. So what basically Indian philosophy, I'm putting it very general, but I wanted to strike this point. What Indian philosophers in general were interested is to understand what you see, darsana, what, what you see. And why do you see in such a way? Do you see any place in, of myst- for mysticism in this phrasing of philosophy? Hardly little, very little. Because when you say see, when you start with perception and sensation, you are starting, you are starting with the basic premises of your experience. But then when you start with love for wisdom, passion for wisdom, that's a big, huge word, right? <laughs> wisdom is a huge word, right? So I was kind of quite uh, astonished by this distinction, you know, which is completely against the popular n- notion or uh, this version that Indian philosophy is more mysticism oriented and European philosophy is more reason oriented. Anyway, that's just a point for you to think about and probably read about it in maybe other books. Uh, what about this Tattva Shastra? Is there, um, how there is Darshana and Tattva Shastra? Tattva Shastra, yeah, Tattva Is it a philosophy? Tattva Shastra equal philosophy or Darshana is equal to philosophy? Which one? The exact Exactly, I won't be able to give you, I mean, uh, as Russell says, what I can't give you any exact in knowledge. In you have a clarity. Yes, yes. In philosophy, you have again mysticism. Yeah, when I can so roughly translate, translate that that yes, that's true. Tattva Shastra literally means how you understand substance or, or, or something you can yes. either translate Tattva as a substance or something more essential, Tattva. Okay, so, some, so it's kind of more a foundational thing. So how you understand something which is in more foundational? You have the same uh, the mysticism, but unlike in Darshana. Uh, you know, I, I, Tattu Shastra, I think in many of our vernaculars, that's the word which is used for. Probably that's why you are mentioning that word. For example, I know that in my language, Malayalam, that is the word for philosophy, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know. If, uh, yeah, so, but what I'm talking about is this original description of philosophy. I mean, this the word Darshana goes back to many many thousands of years back. Uh, probably Tattva Shastra is kind of, you can again trace the etymology maybe more, not so ancient. Sometimes people, you know, those who study philosophy, is a philosopher. I mean, he's a philosopher. Those who are studying Tattva Shastra, is called a Darshanika. Uh, yes, um, I know, I know. You know, one advantage of philosophy is you can at one point, you can mention ten words and confuse the rest of the people. <laughs> You can do it any discipline, but you can do it in a very profound way in philosophy. <laughs> profoundly confusing. <laughs> profoundly confusing. You know, that's one advantage of philosophy. <laughs> so you know, that's why you say that you have this. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of this joke that you talk about this Upanishad Vyapara. You know, you. I mean, Vyapara in Sanskrit can literally mean a kind of a very intense engagement. But in a popular vernacular, it can also mean business. Trade. Yeah. You know, trade. Yeah, trade. Trade. You can also trade with Upanishad, with your scholarship and so on and so forth by uh, building up a profession out of it. So philosophy is kind of very creative enterprise. Uh, anyway. <laughs> okay, so I think our time is kind of uh, moving fast. Uh, we can have probably a tea break at 3.10, but I don't know whether we are ready for a tea break. I don't think we said anything hard to have a tea. We don't need that much caffeine now, right? Uh, what about you, Kishore? I know that you are in a jet lag, so probably you would require some tea, right? I'll be fine. Yeah, no, but we'll break it about in 10 minutes and then because we have a tea break at 3, so we'll have tea and then come back. But we'll see how much time we devote for tea because we uh, might uh, run short of time. Okay, now uh, I want to stop there about defining philosophy unless you want to say something very important now, otherwise we can come back to you again, okay? Of experiences in this whole thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, see, you just mentioned about mind and consciousness. Yes, and that's right. But experiences as a domain area. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I want to come to it, Lena. It's actually, it's the most exciting question, and but it's so complex. You know, I was reading Russell again, the problems of philosophy, and his one chapter, the first chapter, which he re- devotes to appearance and reality. 
and it deconstructs the whole idea of experience you know experience you experience something then but then how how much can you universalize it and as she said unless you have a consensus for what you think you have do you really know whether it is really substantial you know or it is it withstands over a period of time so that's an important question i think we'll come back to it uh, Uh, so if you define philosophy then the next question is defining philosophy what is doing philosophy okay i don't know if some one, any one of you have gone through the material if some of you have gone through the material you might have some clue about it uh, because uh, you know i don't know but maybe some other disciplines it's possible in philosophy uh, studying philosophy involves doing philosophy you know you cannot just study you know for example uh, you can be an art historian without being an artist you can learn political science and but you don't have to be a politician you can be an expert political scientist but you don't have to be a politician but can you do good philosophy without being a philosopher you know it's it's an important question doing philosophy is it doing philosophy is it same as doing any other discipline what i'm trying to say is philosophy probably because of its capacity to question fundamental assumptions about whichever field we are in you know it cannot be a kind of an exclusivistic area you know we may have to have personal engagements all the time unless you put in yourself probably you wouldn't have a value for philosophy because i know that when i do i did philosophy several years before in college and or maybe even now people ask me what's the value of philosophy oh you're doing philosophy okay i know you're wasting your time <laughs> <laughs> you're paying you're being paid for doing nothing <laughs> that's you're very lucky you know to be <laughs> a philosopher and working in national institute of advanced studies people tell me and and people are serious you know people think oh god this person is getting a salary for doing philosophy <laughs> come on <laughs> so you know we have this kind of a prejurity or what should i say a kind of a very uh very flexible view about philosophy after all it's philosophy <laughs> yeah but yeah flexible way of your philosophy you know so if, so but i think uh, we have to sorry so i know you have something rational view of philosophy rational view of philosophy not so flexible <laughs> so is there something more to doing philosophy you know rather than just passing away time or asking questions for which you know that you will never get answers I didn't say this Russell said this actually most of the philosophy which we do we do because we know that we don't get answers and that's why we are interested in asking more questions <laughs> <laughs> professionally it will be kind of enriching and also it kind of quite challenging but uh, uh but then at some point uh, at some point we really start thinking about you know value of philosophy i mean why do we do philosophy But I think one important uh, reason is that it always allows you to question your basic assumptions whichever discipline it is. We all form certain basic structures. I I know that we all say that okay I am a sociologist, I am a biologist. That does not mean that all the structures you use are completely in the framework of sociology or biology. And this I think I was convinced of this after coming to this institute. Between us, okay? But then this another aspect about philosophy is that whatever answers you get in philosophy that kind of kind of gets segregated into <coughs> another discipline that's why philosophy started as this huge body of knowledge and then different disciplines got together right so when aristotle started he had to really you know look at so many different ideas and concepts and more or less we still follow probably a stotian division of disciplines and areas of knowledge but there isn't much change okay do you need a break any time is your mind wandering because i know that in philosophy that can happen uh, often so if you want a break you can take a break huh five more minutes okay all right yes uh, apart from this uh, i mean we talked about disciplines coming out of uh, philosophy but i might also argue that at least in recent times a lot of um, fundamental philosophical questions have been asked in other subjects and they might be the field for example in the whole area of ethics uh, one of the most exciting areas of ethics is right now environmental ethics i mean 
uh, or for that matter, quite a lot of interesting research in the social sciences is dealing with very interesting questions about. Uh, I mean, how do we know what we know? I mean, essentially, how do you study social phenomenon? And then, I mean, that that feeding back to, um, I mean, philosophical assumptions about societies or way societies are structured, the way we perceive social phenomena, or whatever. I mean, it may not be a one-way process in which disciplines come out of uh, uh, philosophy. It might be also a fact that maybe exciting work done in other disciplines might lead to interesting philosophical conclusions and new sets of questions being asked. Mm -hmm. Okay, I completely agree with you. So, for example, some insights in another discipline can lead to a different way of looking at in another discipline, right? Especially in philosophy. Especially in philosophy. Not in fundamental things, for example, for any organisms or any plants or any plant, the fundamental principle is growth and development. The growth and development can never change. So, every is, no, all scientists will agree. So, when you come to that experimental uh, research, everybody has his own uh, uh, interest, I mean his own opinion, and, but fundamental thing is uh, same. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I I disagree that the fundamental is growth. I go the and growth and development. I think there, if you break down growth and development further, just a little more, it's time and change. Ah, and these are again questions which will be addressed by your philosophy. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it, it refers to time and space. It refers to time. So when you start talking about time and space and also about life itself, what grows? Blackboard doesn't grow, life grows. So you start asking questions on life, you're back to... I somehow feel that, as you said, at the end of all uh, subjects also, there is a philosophical culmination. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, have, I have started to see that more and more in all the sciences when they have reached the furthest part of, uh, if you read Stephen Hawking or somebody who is the, uh, the greatest scientist now and who is writing books, uh, a philo being a philosopher helped me to kind of relate to their science uh, much more easily. They are actually talking philosophy rather than just, uh, I mean maybe they may not call it but that's what they are doing, they are addressing life and mm -hmm. the questions that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So I somehow feel combination, both origin and combination ends in combination. Yeah. So yes. How can philosophy be considered as a distinct discipline? Okay. If, if, if it is all about thinking and you know seeking truth, it mm -hmm. happens in it's just a process mm -hmm. which is deployed in every discipline. Mm -hmm. So how can this be as a distinct discipline? Okay. Discipline by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, something that may add to this uh, other question. Um, in mathematics, we have we have two big branches: mm -hmm. pure mathematics, which is doing mathematics for the sake of mathematics when I'm concerned about what what the results actually are. And then we have applied mathematics where we're trying to find out how mathematics could be used to answer physical or socioeconomic uh, mm -hmm. questions. Uh, I was wondering if such a distinction exists in philosophy. If, you have, if there are philosophers right. who do philosophy just for the sake of philosophy and others like environmental right. ethics or medical ethics, which, mm -hmm. which is a very applied uh, mm -hmm specialized thing, if, if this distinction is real amongst philosophers. Oh yeah, well, if you go into that, definitely there are specialized areas in philosophy, but I didn't want to get into a kind of an academic philosophy, I mean, in this discussion, but there are different areas, I mean, um, you know, political philosophy and moral philosophy and uh, uh, there's so many areas in that, and especially in a field like consciousness studies, which is emerging now, and there's so many transdisciplinary areas, which is focusing on. Hmm? I, I, I'm more interested in the distinction yeah. between pure and applied. Mm -hmm. um, the philosophy for the sake of philosophy as opposed to philosophy for the sake of some end. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean more in like academic or in general? No, I, I, if I may, uh, I think the question is whether there is such a thing as philosophy for an end. I mean, like it, you can do maths because you want to answer the question of how to build this engine. Pichini, can you please keep the door open? Okay, it's, it's, there's no air here at all. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you, you want to know how, what are the mathematics involved so that you can build a particular thing. Mm -hmm. Or you can do maths as a pure thing, as a pure process of reasoning or logic. Uh, it, he said, is, does such a distinction exist in philosophy? But then what would you say is the application of philosophy? I mean, no, so I, I think... that applied category, hmm. one can think of uh, the Indian thought. Maybe like you take uh, the Dasas or anybody, 
actually who are uh, preaching the philosophy for the benefit of the mankind, not for the benefit of the philosophy itself. I mean, they want, to, as you said, uh, the moksha, liberation. Why don't you take that uh, liberation itself is an applied one. So when they are working towards the liberation, they are taking a pure one with them. Okay. Uh, you want to know the only applied part. So when they are working towards the pure philosophy, they are I mean, uh, writing uh, the poems or something like that, which actually tells about the pure thing. So uh, maybe uh, people following them, they are uh, uh, realizing themselves. I mean, they are moving towards the moksha. So in that way, I can say there is some applied philosophy for the enlightenment of the soul. Okay, I think okay, I think we'll, we'll come back to this issue. I think uh, maybe at some point uh, because I I have a few things to cover and I'm getting a little nervous about the time because I also want certain literature to be read, you know, in this group and then discuss. So we would have different ranges of discussion. Certainly, this is important, and we'll come back to it. Uh, I also wanted to uh, just put this couple of points more in to finish this round of discussion, which is. Uh, again, will f philosophy help us to ask fundamental questions? And can philosophy just stay as a discipline which asks only fundamental questions, or can it also have certain? That as, that's what the question he said. So I'm kind of rephrasing it. So is it something which stays always in a fundamental level, or is it something which you can say that it? has a kind of a process and develops into more ideas or more applications. Uh, I also wanted to come back to this last point, which is benefits of studying philosophy, because I know that probably these are the only two lectures, today's and tomorrow's are going to be the only two lectures which you will be having in philosophy in, 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 in that sense, probably during your PhD course. So. Uh, even if you think that philosophy would kind of would not have an extensive uh, meaning in your in your own discipline, are there any common benefits for a philosophical way of looking at things or applying certain philosophical questions into your discipline? One is that it will help to a certain extent in developing your pro problem solving skills. You know in a kind of a dilemma situations or paradoxes, you would have a kind of uh, a way of, you can develop a way of looking at things which require complex solutions, right? And the other is, you will be able to develop a certain clarity of thinking, a certain clarity of thinking of your own ideas, and also I think you will be more attentive towards others. Probably what I'm saying now is too obvious to you, but I wanted to make it a little more you know, a little more said, a little loud. Probably this is too obvious to you. That uh, certain ways of looking at things, I mean, philosophical ways of looking at things, extends the range of your clarity, you know, by critiquing the terms, ideas, and categories you use. And also it helps you to, it helps you to reflect upon your own structures which you make. It also helps you to look at another person's viewpoint in in, a, in from a larger context, okay. So in that way, it helps you in. That's why when I said communication skill, I meant this larger area of transference of knowledge, and also understanding your own your own way of looking at things. The other is this again, kind of I'm rephrasing what we have. We, most of us have said earlier. It's it also helps you to uh, uh, kind of. Um, gain or arrive at something which could be described as self-knowledge because this is a fundamental idea in any philosophy self-knowledge a knowledge about the critique of self-identity uh, other thing is the, uh, the last two points of a benefit is huh? persuasive. persuasiveness I thought it was quite funny <laughs> Uh, <laughs> philosophy, yeah, persuasive. Unless you, uh, but to be persuasive, you need to have a strong point viewpoint. Unless you have a strong viewpoint, you will not be able to persuade uh, another person. It's you know, self identity. Yeah, it's a, absolutely. That's right. That's right. So to be persuasive, you need to have a kind of a 
not strong, at least a clear str- point of view. I mean, it, you might change your viewpoint, but at least you need to be clear about what you're saying. More experience-oriented philosophy. I think one last benefit of philosophy is it develops, it accentuates your capacity to empathize. Yes. And which is... Oh, it can be highly subjective. It can be highly subjective. That uh, empathy is a subjective character, but then there is some consensus about it, which means it gives you a little more patience, probably, to listen to another person. That it's that itself is very important, Sahana, because uh, at least in today's life, when everybody has strong points of view, you know. <laughs> We are more and more less losing that capacity to listen to somebody. When, you, when I say listen, I, I really mean uh, just not in any descriptive sense, the openness of your mind. You know, can we, can we, which of course philosophers have talked about this in various terms, you know, kind of Husserl and others have talked about it, but uh, I'm trying to say it in very simple terms. Can, can we have something called an open frame of mind? Can we keep our views for a while and listen to another person? That's which is very important these days to expand your field of knowledge and also to understand. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That's, That's different. Easy. That's a different question. But to listen, to be able to listen. In fact, I should tell you this: these two ideas in Indian philosophy, called manana and shravana, shravana and manana, you know, and uh, they say that uh, the most uh, important or the most uh, dynamic way of listening is. Uh, um, uh, of reflecting is as you listen. When you lif- listen, can you reflect? If you have to reflect when you listen, that means you can, can imagine how much attentive you have to be in that. You know, you have to be completely engrossed in it. If you have to reflect upon something as you listen to something, it's not so easy. You know, either you reflect upon it based on your categories or certain categories, or you just don't reflect at all. You just listen, right? So. So this is again a very complex, more psychological, I would think. You know, so when you said that is empathy more subjective and it's more controversial, that philosophy would help you to be, uh, help you to develop more empathy. I think is yes, it is subjective and. Uh, but don't you think it's very embedded in this whole process of dialogue, of discourse, of arguments? That's true. But philosophy.